In this episode, we're talking about the brains behind the internet connected arcade clock things. How this processor is everything and nothing all in one. So what the heck's that mean, this thing is everything and nothing all in one? Well, when you talk about IoT microprocessor platforms, you're really talking about the potential, because by itself it doesn't do anything out of the box. This has a firmware that allows it to talk to the particle cloud, which is an offering that they provide that allows you to do online mashups and connect it with other services. Beyond that, you have to figure out what to do. Chances are that 90% of the things you want to do have already been done by somebody else. And the particle ID allows you to mash up different libraries to bring them together to provide the functionality that you want to do. In our case, we need to talk to this MP3 player, which is really just a simple protocol to send a couple bytes over a serial channel so that this guy knows what to do. You can say play track one, play track two, something that simple. And the more complex thing task we have at hand is to control the RGB matrix. You know, how do we draw the pictures and the text and things like that? Well, there are libraries to simplify that. So let's open up the particle ID and look at some of the resources there and how we would begin to grapple with writing the software to make this thing work. So when you first go to the particle IDE, you may notice that, you know, the screen's pretty blank and there's not much to it. And when you start a new application, you'll just see a couple of methods there. There's setup and loop. Setup allows you to initialize things that need to be done before the loop starts executing. Setup will be like preparing your RGBs, setting the volume, things that won't really change during your loop processing. And your loop's then responsible for all of the logic like generating the animation frames, updating the RGB, listening to the analog, microphone and things like that. It's all pretty straightforward. You just have to break it down into the specific components and add to it. Now you could start from scratch and sometimes that's the best option. Particle IDE though, however, allows you to share GitHub repos as libraries across multiple applications with multiple users. And in many cases like this one, this project will just be a mashup of a lot of different libraries. I don't want to reprogram those and most of those are well-developed and mature capabilities. So if we go down to the libraries tab, you could begin to search for those. It's important to note that as you start combining multiple libraries, libraries, you may encounter challenges with namespace and closure and scope, and these are all things that you'll learn along the way as you mature in your software development disciplines. But they can pose you some challenges. It's important to step through them procedurally and add capability as you build the application. Don't try to mash it all together at once and make it all work. You'll be in for a headache. So before we start talking about the code, let's step back and talk about the libraries we're going to need. Now nothing we're doing is rocket science. We're just controlling some RGB lights. We're displaying some text, some sprites, some animation, interacting with an MP3 player and a particle system. All of those things have been done before. You've seen them in other places. Unfortunately, all those libraries exist. They're all C-based libraries that we can drop right into this thing. And it's, it's gonna get a little complex and you might have some challenges. I'll make the firmware available so that you don't have to go through that process, but I wanna at least talk through and maybe help you uh, learn so that you can extend and customize this. Now, the first library that we're gonna need is Fast LED. Fast LED is one of the best libraries out there for the fastest RGB control and communication. Unfortunately, it's pretty linear and it's meant for dealing with long strips of RGBs. It doesn't really have a concept of a matrix. You know, generally RGBs in a matrix are ran in a serpentine pattern or something complex like that. So determining, you know, how you draw a ball on that RGB matrix would mean understanding where that each RGB is in that serpentine pattern. So, and they're numbered from one to 256 zigzagging back and forth. And so that's a little complex. And so we'll be using another library called LED matrix, which does some translation so that then we can just work with X and Y coordinates to find the appropriate RGB pixel index to update and change the color when we're generating these frames. So once we have a matrix, we'll want to obviously draw fonts and text on it. But in order to do that, we don't want to draw each of the little pixels for every letter for every animation. You know, we'd rather use something like the LED text library, which will then generate it on our matrix for us. And we can tell it to animate and change the color and do all sorts of cool stuff. In addition to the text, we also have sprites. You know, that's commonly referred to as a graphical animated two-dimensional object, generally a sprite. So to do that, so we could draw all the animations and the graphics by hand, but I'd rather use a library called LED Sprite, which allows us to define our sprites individually, like Pac-Man, you know, the chomping effect as his mouth is opening. Three frames, you define a sprite object, you tell it to animate, in which direction to animate, and you're good to
good to go. The sprite library is overkill for our purposes because it has collision detection and you could play it, you could make an actual game with it. But for our case, we're just gonna define the animatable objects as sprites and then move those through our scene. We're gonna coordinate with the text that's being displayed so it looks like it's a cohesive animation where the reality is our LED text is performing the text animation, our LED sprite is performing the sprite animation. They operate independently and it makes the code really clean. In addition to that, we have this particle system, right? The particle system listens to the sound in the background and it generates particles, kind of a star filled effect based on how loud the ambient audio is. And that's pretty straightforward too. The particle system has lots of flexibility on how you can have the emitter and attractors and how many particles and what's the lifespan and color and yada yada. And you can make it as cool as you want. We're just using a simple particle effect and it's gonna generate those particles from the center of the display. That's something that will update every frame and the particle library will be responsible for generating those animations. It'll be re responsible for maintaining the life of each of those particles that get generated. So a star is born, trickles out, and dies, you know? It'll do that over the course of the animation. So when we mash all those libraries together, all of a sudden we've got fast LED, we've got LED matrix, a LED text, LED sprite, and a particle emitter. Those five libraries together, you know, you're gonna run into a couple challenges. As I was going through it, I found that there were some conflicts in namespaces, it means that variables were used with the same name in the same context, and so I had to work through some of those issues. I was obviously able to iron all those out, and you'll get better with it the more practice that you go through. So once you have those libraries added to your solution, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of creating the variables that you need, initializing the setup to prepare all of your sprites, your font, your text, your connection to the cloud, and matrix parameters, and then you're good to go. Once it starts looping, you're just calling five different libraries and telling them to update it based on certain conditions. You can tell the particle system to animate its particles, you can tell the text to animate its text, tell the sprite to animate its sprite, so on and so forth. And then tell the MP3 player to play some music. It's a piece of cake, so we'll walk through the layout of that source code next. Yeah, but Jim, you're giving away all our best tricks. Back in the particle IDE, let's look at the 8-bit clock application. Now this is the application that runs the clock, and this is the firmware that would ultimately get updated to the device. Now you notice there are a bunch of tabs across the top. Well, many of the libraries that I needed, I had to customize to be compatible with one another. So I made minor tweaks to those and uploaded those as individual files. In addition to the individual files, there are a couple libraries that I'm using that were from the particle library system. The photon particle system is one that I brought over from GitHub and shared it with the community. The photon particle system is responsible for generating the particles. The fast LED library is responsible for communicating to the RGB lights to turn them on as needed. Now we use the fast LED and we reference that in the top portion of our code here. But in addition to that library, we use lots of local files and libraries that I've brought in, such as the LED matrix, LED text, LED sprite, and a few font files. In addition to that, we need to communicate with the MP3. But let's just walk through the main structure of the program here. In the top, you see lots of includes. Includes are how you include libraries in your application. Application. By doing that, it gives you all of the resources that come along with that particular file. In this case, we've got fast LED. We know we're going to need to talk to RGBs. We've got the LED matrix, LED text, LED sprites, everything we already talked about. We're using a font called Robotron. You can change that font or redefine it. In addition to that, we're using the particle system. This particle system library is what we use to generate the particles. We're also using a math library. And then we have an extra file called sprite data, which is where I defined all the sprites, where I define all the Pac-Man, the invaders, the ghosts, all that cool stuff. Once you get done with the includes, there are several defines, several ways that we can define the constants for the application. Now these are like the IO pins that we're using for the LED. You now what is the color order of the RGB lights? In this case, it's green, red, blue. And what is the chipset of the RGB lights? It's a WS20. 2812B. The matrix that we're using is 32 pixels wide and 8 pixels high. And the type is vertical with a zigzag matrix, which means a serpentine pattern that goes up and down, up and down, up and down, all the way across the matrix. It's important for it to know that so that when we use this matrix library, it can calculate the correct RGB. And this is a bit of an advent calendar as well, so we calculate the days until Christmas. So in order for that library to know how to do that, uh, we need to understand the seconds in a day, seconds in an hour, seconds in a minute, and so on and so forth, so that we can make those calculations. Once we've got all our constants done, then I define a bunch of variables. These variables are temporary 
arbitrary placeholders. Think back to algebra 1a. Um, you know, a equals 1, b equals 2, but we're using more common names like seconds, minutes, hours, target year, target month, things like that. Christmas date, pretty straightforward. Once we've got our basic variables out of the way, we define the objects that we're going to use. We have a LED matrix. The matrix object is defined by a width, a height, and a matrix type, and we give it the name of LEDs. Once that object's defined, we defined all the sprites, the scrolling messages, uh, the specific parameters for the particle system, and then we have a couple helper methods down here that translate x to y on our matrix and calculate the date in seconds. We also have a helper method to refresh the current date and calculate the remaining time to Christmas. Next we have the setup method. The setup method is, as I mentioned, the area where we would initialize everything. In this case, we're telling it, yeah, we're gonna use this pen to listen, so we need it to be an input, and we write it to high, which is to leverage a pull-up resistor. Basically sets a default value for that so that it's not unknown. We have a couple local variables. We set up communication. That communication is how we're gonna talk to the MP3 player. The MP3 player is gonna receive a couple of really simple commands to play specific tracks, and it will do the rest for us. We'll set the Christmas date to our target year, month, day, hour, minute, second, all that good stuff so that when we do our calculation of days till Christmas it'll know what day Christmas is on. We also configure the fast LED. We set it up so that it can talk to all the RGBs. We set up the scrolling text. We describe how we want that text to be scrolled and initialize that and we also set up the particle function which is the 8-bit message. It's the function that will be surfaced to the particle cloud that we can relay a message to and it will update our display. After that we set the default position for all of the sprites and we add them to the sprite object. Finally, we set some default settings for the particle system, which is where it's located. We define the particle emitter minimum and maximum life values, and then we reset the renderer. Last thing we do in setup is set the volume to 12 for the MP3 playback device, then we reset the device to stopped. After the setup, the loop will begin to iterate, and that's when all the fun stuff happens. When the loop is called, we will read any messages that the MP3 player may have sent to us, we'll listen to the audio level, we'll update the particle, we'll render Render the LEDs, we'll update the sprites, we'll render the sprites, and update the text message if that's needed. That's all we do. All of the libraries do all of the complex stuff. So this loop is pretty minimal, and that's the purpose of using libraries and encapsulating your code so that you don't have a lot of garbage in your logic and it's easy to understand. In addition to the loop, which iterates one time for every frame of animation, there are a few helper methods below, such as receiving an 8-bit message. So when, when a text message is sent to this device, we'll receive that message here, and we can set the incoming message to the value that was sent into it. So by doing that, the next time that the message is displayed, it will be updated and ready to go. As we're looping through the logic using the LED text library, it will let us know when it needs a new message, when the message has completed and scrolled off. When that message does complete, it calls this message, which then allows us to redefine, which allows us to define the next display message, as well as play a new audio track. So this method is currently set up to account for five different states, or five different messages, and it just moves through them one after the other. So once it gets through the last one, it'll start over with the first message. Pretty straightforward and you can change all of these mp3 commands to play different audio. You can update the micro SD to have new audio files and this is really just the command for the mp3 player to play a file number one, play a file number two, play a file number three, four, and five. It's really straightforward and easy to use. Just that simple byte command is sent to that device and the rest is all handled by that component itself. In addition to setting the default text that, that we'll be scrolling, we'll set basic and common parameters which will determine the color, in which case we're using random colors. We try to keep it a pale color so that it has good contrast with the particle and background systems. We set the frame rate and then we set the text. The rest is the responsibility of the loop. Now a few other methods that we called up in our loop are listen to audio. So this is a method that actually listens to 50 samples from that microphone to determine what the average audio level is. Now once we get that we just set the emitter based on the audio amplitude and the emitter renderer handles the rest of the complexity. Finally we have two methods that are responsible for the mp3 player. We have mp3 command and send command. mp3 command is called with our byte command and the mp3 command method leverages the send command method. Basically
directly encapsulates our requested command into a properly formatted message that the MP3 player can understand. That's it, 340 lines of code. Now fortunately, we didn't have to include all of the logic and code that is encapsulated by these libraries. And if you start looking at those, that can become daunting quick because there's thousands and thousands of lines of capability in those files. So we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. You know, we're saving all of the time and logic and hassle of having to write that ourselves by leveraging these libraries. Now that's not always the best solution and often it can be more efficient to write it all yourself. You can design the library to be very discreet and specific and performant to your specific needs. In this case, it was easier to leverage these shared libraries to accomplish the majority of functionality. So the source code that we needed to implement to leverage all those libraries is very straightforward. Now we can hack this away, change the functionality, change the animation, and it's easy to do just by updating a couple files. For example, the font Robotron defines all of the letters in the alphabet that are leveraged in the text display system. And we can customize these and there's a, there are several other libraries and fonts available as well as the sprite data. The sprite data defines our, all of the sprites that are leveraged. There's a Pac-Man, there's a Ghost, there's a Christmas tree, and you can add animation frames to each of these. Um, there's Space Invaders and all sorts of things. So you can add and make these more complex and more interesting. It's just important that you have to define the sprite data as well as the color table for that sprite. The LED sprite library will do all of the hard work of moving and animating and all of the cool stuff. So learning all of this in one shot is a bit like drinking out of a fire hydrant. You know, there's tons of information and it seems overwhelming, but at the end of the day, it's all pretty straightforward when you break it down into specific pieces of functionality. So in summary, we used a lot of libraries to create this mashup, but ultimately it comes down to organizing your code. As long as you're consistent about the layout and structure of your application, it's easy to manage and understand what's going on. So that's it, piece of cake, right? In the end, practice and experience and an acute attention to detail will yield good results with software. Not to mention, it's kind of like the Golden Gate Bridge. By the time you learn all that stuff, you'll have to reinvent yourself because the technology will have changed. But for now, enjoy the internet connected arcade clock thing and be happy. In the next episode, we'll be talking about building the enclosure. Now get all this source code shared up on a GitHub repo so that you can download it and not have to go through all that headache. But reverse engineer it, check it out, and figure out how you can hack it and make it personal. That's all it's about. In the meantime, stay safe, have fun, and I can't wait to see you next time. Tis the season to be merry. Well, that's my name. Oh, shit. What?